In this video, I will explain how incredibly small gravitational attractions by the moon can cause ocean water to rise. This is often explained very poorly. I'll try to do better. In the oceans, water rises in response to the moon's gravitational attraction. But how can it do that when the attractive force is so small? In the first video, I explained that at the Earth's surface closest to the moon, the resulting upward force on any mass amounts to about one ten millionth of the force by which Earth's gravity is holding that same mass down. To lift any object, you will at least have to apply a force which overcomes its weight. When you look at this video, you will see water going up and you will see fishing boats going up as well. But I want you to pay attention to what you do not see. Look at this fishing boat, look at this building, look at the cars here. You don't see them rising vertically, even though any attractive force by the moon on them is about the same as for the water and the floating fishing boats. The reason that the water and the fishing boats in it rise isn't because a tiny vertical force is pulling them up. It's because water is pressing in from the bay and pushing them up. When you add up the water pressure on the bottom of these boats and on the underside of any volume of water, it will add up to lift and support their weight. Pressure is lifting and supporting them, not any minuscule attraction by the moon. To explain how that pressure comes about, we have to look at the big picture. The tiny forces in the ocean accumulate into a non-negligible pressure. How do they do that? To see how a drop of water would want to accelerate across the Earth's surface, due to the moon's attraction, you will have to compare that water drop's acceleration to the acceleration of the Earth underneath. It's like a skater going down a hill inside the cargo hold of a semi-trailer. If you want to know how fast he will be moving across the cargo floor, it isn't enough to just know how steep the hill is. You will need to know if the semi-trailer is accelerating down the hill as well. It's the same with the water on Earth. You can calculate how the moon's gravitational attraction would want to accelerate a water drop towards it, but you will have to correct that for the Earth's own acceleration. You can see how this works for different surface positions in this cross-section diagram. For the sublunar point, the surface point closest to the moon, it's pretty straightforward. You calculate the acceleration which the moon's attraction would want to give an object there. Then you subtract the acceleration of the Earth underneath. You can visualize this subtraction by inverting the Earth's acceleration vector and placing it at the tip of the object's acceleration vector. Now this difference is the vector by which our object would want to accelerate with respect to the Earth due to the Moon's attraction. I'm saying would want to accelerate because it will not be accelerating freely in that direction. It's being held down by Earth gravity and the objects around it. If you'd have an extremely accurate scale, you might notice that its weight has decreased by about one ten millionth, but that's about it. What is essential as you will soon see, is that the moon's gravitational attraction exerts tiny forces on mass particles which cannot respond freely and will consequently mostly push against adjacent mass particles. For an object here, it may not be obvious how to correctly determine the tidal acceleration. Again, you calculate the acceleration due to the moon's gravity and point its vector straight towards the moon. But then, to subtract the acceleration of the Earth underneath, we take this same vector we used before, invert it and place it at the end of the object's vector. The reason that this is justified is because the Earth moves through space like a big semi-rigid blob. All mass on the planet pretty much moves along with it, whether or not it is rigidly attached. And so does the environment of our object. You can do this for more surface positions, all the way around the Earth. For instance here, at a position which is equally far away from the Moon as the center of the Earth. The acceleration of a mass here will be equal in magnitude to the Earth's, but angled towards the Moon. When the Earth's acceleration vector is placed at its tip, you'll see that the net acceleration for a mass here points downward. Going further on to the far side, we see that an object's lunar gravitational vector becomes smaller than the Earth's and is still angled. When we now make the same construct, we see that the net acceleration vector is actually pointing away from the Moon. Many people find that hard to grasp, 
that even though both accelerations point towards the moon, the net effect points away from the moon. This effect is maximized here. Even though an object here wants to accelerate towards the moon, the Earth's surface underneath wants to do that even harder, although both accelerations are tiny. This makes it feel like an upward acceleration away from the Earth, away from the moon, for the object. What you get when you visualize the tidal forces around the planet like this is known as the tidal force envelope. But be careful, this is another huge pitfall for many people who are convinced they understand the ocean tides, but really don't. Having come this far, many people seem to simply assume that the ocean waters will take the shape of the tidal force envelope. This is totally incorrect. It shows that they haven't stopped to wonder how the water really reacts to the tidal forces. Mind you, the reason my envelope looks egg-shaped is because I chose to place the moon very close to the earth in my constructions. In reality, the envelope will be more symmetrical. But one more thing I want to point out about the tidal force envelope is that any depiction of it you see is by necessity an exaggeration. Just suppose you were to depict Earth's own gravity in a similar envelope. If you choose to portray the downward acceleration of Earth gravity as a 98.1 cm downward envelope, then the maximum magnitude of the tidal force envelope, in comparison, would look pretty much like this. It is one ten millionth of the magnitude of Earth gravity. If you want to show it at all, you have to exaggerate it. Let's take a sand grain here. Like all the sand cranes around it, it's being held down firmly by Earth gravity. Earth gravity pulls it down with a force which would make it accelerate downward with 9.81 meters per second squared if the surface suddenly disappeared. Then along comes the moon which wants to give our sand grain an acceleration of about 1 10 millionth of a g upwards. What do you think will happen? Nothing will happen. All of our sand grains here will feel lighter by about 1 10 millionth and will stay snugly wedged together like they were before. But interestingly, what happens with the sand grain here? The net acceleration of our sand grain is mostly sideways. This means that it will stay wedged in place, but now it puts a tiny bit of pressure on its neighbor. What happens to that pressure? In sand, very little happens to it. Sand doesn't transfer pressure very well. But a fluid medium with low internal friction, like water, behaves differently. A water drop here will also push against the adjacent drop. This adjacent drop, in turn, will transfer this pressure onto the next drop, because it's almost incompressible and loses very little of the force to friction. The next water drop will also add a bit of pressure due to the lunar gravitational attraction it experiences. If this can go on over large distances without being interrupted, it will eventually accumulate into a pressure which is not negligible. This is how the tidal rising of ocean water begins. The horizontal components of the net gravitational attraction by the moon accumulate into water pressure in the oceans. The horizontal components are not opposed by Earth gravity, which works at 90 degrees to them. And that's why they can accumulate. But it takes many kilometers of undisturbed water to have a noticeable effect. As I've said before, the maximum tidal acceleration vector occurs here and it's in the order of one ten millionth of Earth's gravity. But it has no horizontal component, so its effect is negligible. The maximum horizontal tidal component occurs here, very close to 45 degrees away from the sublunar point. Here the tidal vector points upwards by about 18 degrees and is about one third weaker than at the sublunar point. When you go further towards the lateral point, Initially the tidal vector goes more horizontal, but it decreases too much in magnitude. When you go back towards the sublunar point, its magnitude increases, but it points more vertically. The maximum horizontal component occurs here. Its magnitude here is approximately 8 100 millionth meter per second squared, which means that it would cause a horizontal force of 8 10 thousandth newton on a 1,000 kilogram mass here. If that's a 1,000 kilogram rock, 
you'll find that many other forces on the same rock will overpower that tidal force. Even the force of the wind on that rock will outperform the tidal forces thousands of times over. But if that 1000 kilogram is a 1 by 1 by 1 meter volume of water, this tidal force adds and transfers 8 10,000 newton per square meter to the adjacent water volume. Over 1000 meters that would add up to 8 tenths newton per square meter. Over 100 kilometers that adds up to 80 newtons per square meter. 80 newtons per square meter is no longer negligible. It's enough to support a water layer of 8 millimeters. So what would happen when a force like that is accumulating pressure is that over considerable distances the pressure gradient would attempt to push water forward. But that's not easy. Water's pretty heavy and you don't just shift an ocean forward. So the pressure gradient will cause water to start going in a direction where it can go, up. And this is no problem because as we just saw, the increased pressure is capable of supporting raised water. Does that sound familiar? But what I've been talking about here is known as the equilibrium tides. Idealized tides as they would occur on a non-rotating, water-covered planet without disturbances. The Earth, however, is a rotating planet with variable ocean depths and land masses which greatly complicate the formation of the ocean tides. And it isn't as simple as there will be some lag or delay. In the next video I'll explain why nothing resembling the equilibrium tides can form on Earth and why the tides show up at our beaches the way they do.